Avatar The Last Airbender, hailed by so, so many as being the cornerstone of immaculate TV storytelling. Perfectly balancing a tone of innocence, humour and quirkiness that you would expect from any children's show, alongside some truly mature themes and story beats with war, death, totalitarianism and so much more. To many critics, fans and creators, Avatar is seen as being as close to perfection as possible for a show of its kind. The expansive fantasy world and its moving mechanics, the depths and conflicts within each of its characters, and the viscous coagulation of all these parts magically coming together. It's a show that has garnered a cult following and several spin-off extensions, and now it's getting another one. Yes, you may have heard as soon as yesterday, or maybe even September 2018 when the cogs first actually started turning, but Avatar The Last Airbender is getting a whole new adaptation as a fully fleshed out live action remake in partnership with Netflix. And though there is the notorious other live action adaptation that never existed, this new production is being followed up with a massive wave of hype as time goes by as more production details are being released. The largest and most obvious change of course being that this remake is being helmed by the core original creators of the actual cartoon. Yes, the infamous Michael DiMartino and Brian Konitzko are the masterminds behind this production, and they have no intention of hitting the same roadblocks of it which must not be named. In fact, they have made it incredibly clear that casting-wise, they are absolutely planning to keep the characters culturally appropriate and not at all whitewashed. Other sources like the voice actor of Toph have said that they'll be looking towards North Asia and Southeast Asia for their actors for the Fire Nation and the Earth Kingdom. Meanwhile, with Ankh being a monk, you can imagine he'll have more Tibetan origins. On top of that, a direct comment from the creators has them say that this is a wonderful once in a lifetime chance to build upon everyone's work and go even deeper into the characters, story, action and world building. And yes, that means this isn't just a one to one visual adaptation from cartoon to live action, but will in fact be injecting all sorts of extra content and tweaks in order to create an even more solid story to be told. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. While usually in a coming back video I'd review the original and speculate from there, you don't really need me to tell you that Avatar is great. So instead we're going to give a damn good go at looking at how to improve what is already a close to perfect show, as that is exactly what the core creators will be doing themselves. With it being a new Netflix production, the format of each episode is clearly going to change. No longer will there be 23-ish minutes per episode, but we'll be much more likely to have far longer episodes closer to 45 minutes or even an hour, and potentially a chunk less episodes because of that. And while skeptics are concerned on the idea of this just being stretched out filler, what's far more likely is a more enriching experience of extensions across each character's personal developments, how the world moves and works beyond what we've already seen, and how the action itself can be better expressed too. So what can be tweaked and added upon? Well, let's have a brief overview of the show through its chronology to see where there's room for more stuff. Obviously, much of the first season is all classic episodes that really set the foundation, but even beyond the glaringly large parts of the story, there are all sorts of smaller scale elements that can clearly be expanded further with a little extra screen time. I mean, the easiest target right up front is all of the other named characters that appear for their smaller roles. Across season one, we meet folks like the Kyoshi Warriors, who sure conduct training with soccer, but could have some time to explore more of their role for the village, or connect them with the rest of the main cast more. Or or on a more individual level, we meet characters like Haru, the oppressed earthbender, Meng, the kid with a crush on Aang, Che, the second firebending army deserter, and Tio, the paraplegic with a wheelchair glider. Some of these do reappear later on for future events near the end, but these kind of one-offs can especially be expanded further to hear more of their personal stories and perspectives on the world and the war going on, or can be given some additional events to play around with to make them a more concrete ally for the whole team, rather than the faster and to the point approach of a shorter episode's runtime. Or perhaps with those reoccurring characters, more foreshadowing can be implemented with the idea of how their future paths will cross again later. And these things don't even need to be serious or story focused. Having someone like Meng have their own montage of trying to gain Aang's attention a little while while he's pining for Katara's attention at the fortune telling village is a simple enough way to give us more characterization and more of that goofy charm of the series. And hey, maybe it can show us more of Aang's struggle too. 
And then there's the fan favourite character we can't ignore, Cabbage Man, who could probably get his own episode at this point, but more of him ain't exactly a bad thing, I suppose. I mean, he did write the parody overview, after all. He, he's pretty prevalent. Just imagine, a random Netflix episode opens up and it's the Cabbage Man story of his perspective of their adventure. And speaking of that foreshadowing element, of course there will be all sorts of veteran fans watching this series with the full knowledge of the entire picture. So using this as an opportunity to sneak in more fan service can only boost the wit of the screenplay in a multitude of ways. Knowing that Uncle Iroh is a member of the White Lotus, perhaps being able to see more specifics of the Game of Pi show can give a subtle nod to those in the know. And something else for others we meet like King Bumi and Zhong Zhong, something that first time viewers wouldn't really notice, but it's something that could connect them all for the veterans. Or how's about the fate of Admiral Zhao, the villain of the first season? From Legend of Korra we've come to learn that he was dropped into the fog of lost souls, never to die, but to instead spend all of eternity spiralling into madness. Perhaps now knowing that that is his end, there can be more elements planted throughout his story to link to that cruel conclusion. The original already has the element of him wanting to be remembered in history only for him to be immediately forgotten by the rest of the world, so maybe in the future it can be expanded upon further. But forget about the future, think about now. If you're liking this speculative discussion, do consider subscribing. As of this week, we have officially surpassed 150,000 subscribers, which is just insane considering how much we've grown in the last half a year. I can't thank all of you enough. And remember, only you can help fight the battle against my non-subscribe ratio count. A lot of the more obvious changes to be made are ones that were already covered in the parody stage show in Season 3. They kind of cover the most overt issues with the show, such as the Great Divide, which most likely will just be skipped entirely or vastly warped into something new, or even the whole drill sequence. Apparently the reception to that was awfully lukewarm, and in general, the drill just seemed to hold very little weight in the end. It appeared almost out of nowhere, apart from some subtle foreshadowing, and then was dropped just as quickly. Perhaps building it up more could have improved its quality, as well as adding more suspense through the endeavour. I've heard suggestions of a stealth sequence could improve it narrowly, but to some extent some tweaks here would be very likely. Everything else is just more fan service, really. Like, perhaps seeing just how Aang got his master's tattoos at such an early age. Seeing the original Air Nomads again thriving can only be a good thing. And even though they have a tragic end, maybe even being able to see them fight back a little bit against the Fire Nation during that moment could be an amazing start to the series, even if it's shown halfway through with Aang's backstory. And being able to see more of them in their prime, even if it's during their final moments against the Fire Nation, would just be really cool to see. We know it has happened, but we don't really get to see it until now. Generally, the most important part is to avoid any and all problems from the movie. Make sure the characters are presented right, make sure nothing seems stupid, and get some genuine humour in there. Soccer has to be funny, and at most, maybe make a couple jabs at it while you're there. Maybe have someone mispronounce them as Ang and Soka, only for them to turn around and tell them to never pronounce it like that again. Now while I've started mostly here on season one, a lot of the minor changes I can see coming to fruition for this live action adaptation can actually be seen as something more general to the overall presentation of the story, as many traits that can be changed can spread across the entire three season saga. For example, like, let's talk cinematography. The original Avatar cartoon is absolutely gorgeous with its varying colour palettes and many of the standout shots that you may not have appreciated as much as a kid. And though I'm already sure that many of these shots taken into a one-to-one -one form in live action will only continue to stun us further, what was especially the case for the original was a clear progression in animation quality and technology over time with the first episodes looking vastly different to the version in the final episode, which by this point had integrated full-on CG moving objects, which only expanded further into Legend of Korra. With that upgrade available from the very start, there's only more room for further visual spectacle to be made, especially with the early seasons, though there was still some CG there anyway. And from a symbolic perspective, I noticed far more details within the third season compared to the first in ways of reflecting certain characters. Like how when speaking to a caged Iroh, Zuko is framed to always be behind the bars, whilst Iroh has such a clear and free perspective in his mind that the cinematography follows through on 
on that. Or look at those cases of match cuts, either for comedic effect or right in the middle of a simultaneous battle sequence of some kind. Seeing what kind of parallels and twists can be added to the cinematography throughout is something I'm particularly looking forward to. And hey, there's plenty of content that we know about that has been covered in other Avatar media that doesn't quite make its appearance in the original cartoon, which could easily see some expansions with this new version. Obviously, we've got features like the comic storyline adding on to the end of the story, as well as pieces of the past and future that can easily be covered more. Remember when Roku first told Aang of his year-long quest, quoting that it had been done before? Well, we didn't actually see that happen until we saw the Avatar's origin story with Wan in Legend of Korra. And with Korra being known to the world now, all sorts of foreshadowing could be inferred towards her as a cheeky nod too. Or maybe other characters from her series too. Maybe Toph makes a comment about liking the peace and quiet of the swamp one day or something like that. Maybe, maybe more subtle than that, but you know what I mean. Actually, Korra did also push its boundaries a little by tackling more mature tones of the series, which though a little dodgy on the reception, could be interesting to see tweaked with this new partnership with Netflix. I'm not exactly saying that air suffocating should return or that earthbenders should suddenly protrude spikes from the ground, but perhaps playing up the darker tones could be a fun refreshing piece to what is already pretty great. Anyway, let's touch on Season 2 for more simple coverage changes. Season 2 gives us more one-offs like General Fong, the Carefree Bards, and the young Lee, who can all be expanded a little to find their motives. And sure, maybe the Bards can give us a toss a coin to your Witcher-esque earworm song. I can see it happening. Then building up in size, we're introduced to Jet and the Freedom Fighters, who I'd totally love to see more of from the smaller guys. And yeah, hey, can we get a more concrete death? Yeah, thanks. Also, actually, death in general could be a bump in darkness that really pushes the point forwards. This is a war we're in, after all, so let's have some real effects. Just don't overdo it, you know? Azula and her friends could also do with a little more backstory coverage up front. I mean, we hear about it later, but, you know, it's just something. We also get to see a small extract of Avatar Kyoshi's story, which, though is pretty comprehensive, could be more fun to play around with more. Along with any other avatars, really, or Aang's origins himself. Seeing more of him with Boomy from before, or just any experiences from his past, can help us expand the character a lot, and it's just great fan service. Of course, we also meet Toph this season, who's pretty well-rounded, though gets a lot less family origin story than the others. And boy, do I actually want to see The Rock to be cast as the boulder. Second time lucky, right? I also found out while researching this that he actually had a pet croco cat called The Pebble, and a whole comic arc with it. Ch sure, give us some of that, please. We've also got the library sequence, which can help foreshadow all sorts of elements from the future with its boundless knowledge, more so than it already does, perhaps, and can infer to its spiritual existence later in the timeline. And then there's the fan favorite episode, Tales of Ba Sing Se. This narrative masterpiece is the kind of thing I would love to see reformatted with other episodes more, and is kind of how I'm imagining a lot of moments and expansions as being. Just mini little solo stories and unique duos that we didn't really get to see quite so much in the original show to highlight more of the emotion or character based side of the whole adventure. In fact, I could probably happily handle a whole season based in Ba Sing Se. And hey, want to break my heart more? Then show me some actual footage of General Iroh with his son. A couple other solo stories we get are Zuko Alone and Appa's Lost Days, which already gained a ton of awards for its representation of animal cruelty, but seeing that with the big CGI beast can potentially drive that home all the more. And finally, seeing more of the spiritual side of Aang, like the symbolism of his avatar state, could be cool to see reimagined or extended on through the Guru Chakra sequence, or of course, the climax of the whole season as well. And from a more complex world building perspective, this season brings a lot more political alignments and deals with the Fire Nation from other organizations like the Dai Li, the Library, the Freedom Fighters and the Earth King all having different angles on the larger world and their part in it. Or how the Fire Nation is slowly upgrading itself in the war with the invention of its war balloons. Perhaps adding more to the strategy and higher up decisions could be an interesting way to keep the world moving in a way that the original cartoon didn't really show. You know, we haven't seen too much of how the Fire Nation is actually working and planning behind the scenes, and how everyone reacts to that. Just don't make it dry, and please keep the Fire Lord hidden away until Season 3. We don't need a nonsensical repeat of It Which Must Not Be Named. And 
actually, a pretty big element I somehow haven't mentioned yet is the actual fight scenes. Avatar has some fantastic choreography with its fighting styles, and I wouldn't expect that to really change, but an improvement I could enjoy seeing is simply expanding certain action scenes to heighten the experience. Like that one episode blazing through to the Fire Nation Island for a chat with Roku at his statue. There's a whole aerial battle with the fleet and the sages in the temple and the whole fire door sequence too. It's a lot of goodness and seeing changes to the environment like more of that aerial battle could be incredible to see real We've got a lot of on the ground fighting, maybe expanding higher up could be really fascinating. Thankfully enough, as more outer context for this production continues, the likelihood of this coming out as a true masterpiece only seems to rise higher and higher, as more members of the original crew have been confirmed to make an appearance, including the likes of Jeremy Zuckerman, who was the original composer for Airbender and Legend of Korra, which is just fantastic news, as well as executive Jenna Boyd. Unfortunately, it's not a full crew reunion though, as head writer Aaron E. Has isn't as involved due to his other Netflix project, the Dragon Prince, though he has commented with some optimistic takes on the whole matter. Similarly, we haven't heard word of the likes of Joaquin Dos Santos, who organised some of the greatest moments of the whole series, though they are also likely occupied with their work on a little thing called Into the Spider-Verse 2. As a couple extra notes on the production side of things, we also have confirmed that the new concept designer, Jan Chol Lee, had previous works on the likes of Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs and Big Hero 6, which is pretty exciting. Whilst the actual production of the film has been a tad delayed, not just because of the pandemic right now, but also because filming didn't quite seem ready for its original schedule start of February this year. Still, that's enough production spiel, let's talk about season 3. It's a long time off considering this will probably be several series, though perhaps filming would all be done in bulk considering the hurdle of a young cast against the real passage of time. Season 3 ties all of the last knots and heightens the serious tones a tad more. We learn of the other perspective with the Fire Nation and their villages, schooling and its problems, as well as a whole lot more of the Fire Lord's history and Avatar Roku. One episode in particular tells us all of Roku's story, which is satisfying enough, but I feel I could handle a little more intensity of this sort earlier on by exploring more of Sozin's destruction of the Air Nomads way near the start of the series. Especially if it could insinuate how the Air Nomads attacked back as a group, something we never really get to see until Legend of Korra. We also get more heartfelt moments like Katara and Sokka's connection and the Azula Gang's origins, which could be expanded more so to get more from the characters. There's the darker elements introduced like Bloodbending and Combustion Man, which while perfect on their own, would be cool to see explored more. Korra also gave us more new uses for each elemental type, but perhaps switching tactics up in this new adaptation could help keep things fresh. Just little things. I would especially like to see more teamwork in bending utilised as special moves that intertwine together, but hey, that might be a bit too much. With Zuko now joining Team Avatar and the whole thing getting more screen time overall, maybe this time we can finally get a Zuko and Toph duo adventure something only the others got originally. Really, I just want more of those kind of duos that you don't get to see as much throughout the series. As the story comes to a close, more foreshadowing elements would be appreciated. Though it was subtle, the whole element of the lion turtle saving the conflict suggestion was a little hard to catch, so bringing them up more may make the whole thing more believable and thus satisfying, and similarly with the White Lotus members. Though the whole point is them being mysterious, I definitely would love for more of those cheeky nods for those that know when first meeting characters like Boomy and Zhong Zhong, just to make everything feel a little more connected and a little less Deus Ex Machina, you know? And with the end, there's still all sorts of questions and gaps that could potentially be covered for that last extension of fan service, Or just leave it as it is, it's all pretty perfect anyway. There's a heap on information to how this new Netflix adaptation is shaping up to be, alongside a fair heap of speculative changes that I could see or would like to see happening in the future. Whether this is a pretty faithful repeat with some safe expansions taken, or an opportunity to make some serious writing detours, I think at the end of the day, this production is going to come out as an absolute masterpiece of television. I feel I'm already foaming at the mouth just thinking about the visuals. My only real concern is translating the goofy side with live action successfully since some things just seem better fit for animation, but that's not really for me to worry about. If you have any suggestions on what tweaks you'd like to see from this full on remake, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Otherwise, let's just keep waiting this out and remember, there never was an Avatar movie in Ba Sing Se. My name's been Daz, you didn't really care, and I'll see you.
in a bit. <sighs> Rewatching the entire Avatar series for video research? Yeah, I can imagine that's not the worst fate in the world. <laughs>